are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. I invite you to turn with me to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we will read from verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose, If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Amen. We thank God for his word. Having read uh, from 1 Corinthians 12 by way of cross-reference, I invite you to turn to Ephesians and to chapter 4 as we continue our studies in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And as we turn to the Bible, we turn to God in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you that now we turn together to your holy word. We're not now here in order to listen to the meanderings of some man's mind, uh, well-intentioned ethical directives, whatever else, but rather that we might have a divine encounter with you, the living God, that we might uh, have the word of God illumined to us by the power of the Spirit of God in order that we might be drawn afresh to the Son of God and in the reality of that, uh, drawn into sweet communion with one another. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's read verses 4, 5, and 6, which is where we are. We won't get into this hardly at all, but at least we can break in this morning. Uh, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You'll notice that this is a Trinitarian passage, hence our singing of holy, holy, holy. It wasn't random, it was purposeful, that we'd be reminded of the fact that God is one and three and three and one, And you will notice verse 4 refers to the Spirit of God, verse 5 to the Son of God, and verse 6 to God the Father. 
Now, for any who are just joining us, we've been through uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians, and we have noted and tried to make it clear to one another that the first three chapters are are essentially doctrinal, that Paul is laying down the nature of God's purpose from all of eternity, what it means to be included in Christ, the wonder of what he has done in breaking down walls and barriers between the Jew and the Gentile, and uh, making a whole new body and a whole new man, as he puts it, namely this one that is in Christ. And having dealt with that, at the beginning of chapter 4, he moves, as he does routinely in his letters, from the doctrinal to the practical. He's going to now say, uh, here will be the evidences, the implications of the instruction that I've just given you. And you will notice if your Bible is open that he is going to immediately urge the uh, believers there in Ephesus to, as he puts it, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In other words, he wants them to live in such a way that the unity which is theirs already in the Lord Jesus Christ may first of all be maintained and then in turn, as we will see, might be displayed. And we noted in an earlier study, verse 3, that those who are receiving this word are to be those who are eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's a straightforward observation, but an important one, that they are not being charged with creating the unity, but rather with cultivating it. And the experience and the enjoyment of harmony or unity in the gospel is going to be when those who are in Christ are taking seriously what that actually means. Because let's understand that this group to whom he writes of uh, probably various congregations in this uh, Ephesus area were now radically different from their surrounding culture. They were not simply slightly different— they were completely different. Uh, They had once been caught up in all of these things, as he's going to go on and speak about many of them, and to say, you know, uh, you're not supposed to be like this. You were once like this, and the reason you're not supposed to be like it is not because you're trying to make yourselves acceptable to God, but because God, the Blessed One from all of eternity, has reached down into your wretched, pitiable lives and has brought you into Christ. And so now you shouldn't look and act and seem like those who are around you. In other words, the unity of the gospel will be compromised in Ephesus or in Cleveland to the extent that those who are in Christ find ourselves being far more influenced by our being in our culture than being in Jesus. So if we live in a culture— which I think to a certain extent we do, a culture that encourages people to be uh, horribly opinionated, to be selfishly ambitious, to be perniciously aggressive, and to the extent that that is then found within the lives and communion of those who are professing to be in Christ, then obviously uh, the light of the gospel is diminished significantly. Now, these kind of ugly weeds are not, says Paul, to be tolerated. In Jesus, uh, you're supposed to become a flowering beauty. And the beauty that is to be seen, as he's pointed out in verse 2, will contain humility and gentleness and patience. Humility is a prerequisite for harmony— Imagine at the Christmas concerts, if we'd come to the Christmas concerts, and on one particular evening, uh, the choir uh, just went off its rocker, and, um, and, and the tenor section uh, began to become peculiarly competitive and decided to sing louder than all the rest of the choir. And the altos became, for whatever reason, jealous of the sopranos, and they decided to sing far too fast. And the bass section— completely bemused by all of this, just stop singing altogether. <laughs> well, what would that, that have been like? The noise would have been horrendous. 
and the visitors would have started to leave. Well, you can make the application, can you? It's a picture. Imagine that happens in the church, amongst the people of God. One group begins to go this way, another group goes that way, one group gets fed up and goes home, takes their ball and heads for the hills, and so on. It's not to be this way. Not to be this way by God's design, and it is not to be this way by God's enabling. Paul isn't encouraging these believers in Ephesus to try and become what they are not. He is urging them to become what they are. And it is of vital importance that we remind ourselves, as we've tried to say, that the doctrinal provides the foundation for the practical, that the order is important, and it is imperative that they're always kept together. What was true of these individuals? He's already told them. They've enjoyed the sh- they, they share the same blessings in Jesus. In chapter 2, the barriers that once were huge between them have been broken down in Jesus. In chapter 3, they are now fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ and through the gospel. So, in other words, th- this is a gospel church to which he writes. This is not some organization of religious types. This is a church that has been established as a result of the work of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, opening blind eyes, softening hard hearts, bringing people from all kinds of different backgrounds into the unity which is expressed here in this section. Now, interestingly, having belabored the point that he is moving from the doctrinal to the practical, in actual fact, when you look at this, he's he's actually right back at the doctrinal again, isn't he? because he's now giving us instruction on the nature of the church. And it's going to, we're going to have to wait, really, until verse 17, till he gets back to, Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. He started that in, in verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling, do it like this and this and this. And then he says, then he starts to give instruction about the church. And many of our problems as Christian believers is because we don't understand the church. We don't understand the nature of what it means to be placed in Christ and embedded with one another. It's not something that is an added extra to Christian experience. The fierce individualism of our nation is such that we view most things in that way. Well, do I feel that I will gain from this? Do I feel that I would like to participate in this? After all, it's really about me and what I want and how I'm doing and where I'm going and how I'm spending my time. No, it's not. It's actually not, because the same grace that reconciles us to God brings us into relationships with one another, the relationships which then define our existence. It's a truism, but it's, that's, it's a truism because it's true, that God is, in the, God is working to put us all together in a new heaven and a new earth, together. You know, you, you're not going to live in your own little parcel all by yourself, excluded from everybody. No. So now we're supposed to be getting ready. Now, if we wanted to work our way through the 16 verses, I'll just give you a possible outline here, which we're not going to use. In verse 3, he's called on them to maintain the unity. Down in verse 12, he's going to encourage them in relationship to the works of ministry. And by the time he gets to the conclusion of this section, he is reminding them that they are to be growing in maturity. So, uh, first of all, maintain this unity, get involved in ministry, grow up to maturity. And again, in relationship to the insert this morning, if you want to grow up to maturity, then get involved in ministry, because it is involvement in ministry that gives expression to the nature of our unity. So, you say, well, let's begin. All right, there is one body. There is one body. That's as far as we'll go. He provides, you will notice, a sevenfold foundation upon which the unity is built. Uh, Seven times he uses the word one. One. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. 
Now, let's just make the point. It's a small point, but an important point that he is stressing unity, but he is not calling for uniformity. Uniformity. Unity and uniformity are not necessarily the same. You can put a group of people all in the same uniform in a basketball team and yet not have unity out on the court. You can ask people to all dress in the same way and yet not in their heart of hearts be united. The, the, the beautiful thing about the church, as we'll go on and see later in the chapter, is that the, the unity is not by the diminishing of diversity, but it is in the embracing of that diversity. Hence, uh, the picture of the body. And uh, we can all understand that. The various parts of the body are absolutely vital because there is only one body, and no one part has prominence over the others. Now, Paul uses the body, I think, as his favorite metaphor. Uh, he's already mentioned it twice in chapter 1 and again in chapter 2, and now he comes to it again. He uses other pictures of the church. Here in Ephesus, he has referred to them as fellow citizens and as uh, members of the same family, uh, as living stones in the temple that God is building. And as we will see in chapter 5, he's referring to the church as the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this body metaphor, I think, is uppermost in his writing. And actually, I think it may well be unique to Paul. I wonder why. And there's no good answer to the question. I'm just letting you know that I wonder why. And as I wondered, I wondered whether it is not directly tied to his own conversion experience. Because you will recall that when he was on his way to Damascus, breathing out threatenings and slaughter to the followers of Jesus— that he encountered Jesus on that road. And the word that came to him from heaven was, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And of course, Saul's reaction would, not, would necessarily have been, well, actually, uh, who are you, Lord? I don't know, but I, I wasn't persecuting you. I was persecuting them. And then the dawning realization— that for Saul of Tarsus to be involved in the persecution of the followers of Jesus was to be involved in persecuting Jesus. Why? Because of the unique union between Christ, who is the head of the body, and the body itself. You cannot make an impact on one part of the body in isolation from the rest if the body is fully functional. It, you, can't, you can't say, I have a problem with my thumb, but it's nothing to do with the rest of us. It's got everything to do with the rest of you. It's localized there, but impinges upon all. Now, when Paul uh, works this out for um, his readers in writing both to Corinth, as we've seen, and also to Rome, he makes it very clear. This is Romans 12. For as in one body we have many members, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So there is only one body. You only have one body, and so do I. And you have life which animates your body. When that life no longer animates your body, your body will be dead, and it will be dispensed with. That's his picture. When he says there is only one body, what he's saying is there is only one church. There is only one church, because there is only one Spirit. And the same Spirit— that indwells you as an individual in Jesus, indwells the person next to you who is also in Jesus. The same Spirit. You don't have your own. It's the same. But even greater than that, the same Spirit that indwells us this morning is the Spirit that indwelled the Reformers 500 years ago. The same Spirit that is at work in the people of God in a locale here in North America is the same spirit that is at work in northern India and in North Korea and in the heartlands of Europe and so on. That's what he's saying. There's nothing like it in the entire universe. This is not just like— you can't find an analogy here in simply organizational structure or invisible unity or in external things. 
No, it is far more fundamental than that. There is only one body, only one church. Well, how can that be? You drove here this morning. How many churches did you drive past? You drove past a whole ton of churches, didn't you? And you're sensible people, and you're going, well, there are, there are church buildings all over the place. Of course there are. And Paul knew that there were churches in Ephesus, there were churches in Crete, there were churches in Corinth, and so on. So what's he saying? Well, clearly he's not talking about the visible entity. He's talking about the invisible reality. He's not talking first about the external expression. He's talking about the essential nature of the church. One body that is made up of all kinds of people from all kinds of places living at all kinds of time in history. That's why when we say, as we often do, that God is in the business of putting together a company that no one can number from every tribe and nation and language and tongue, a people of his very own. When we say that, this is what we're referring to. This is what we're referring to. Now, who are these people that make up this one body? Well, that's why the doctrinal precedes the practical. You say, well, who is he talking to? What is it that makes them this one body? If you're here this morning, you're saying to yourself, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm in it or I'm not in it. Don't confuse a question about where your, quote, membership is in an external structure for the moment. Just go back to the beginning, and you'll have the answer to your question. All who are in Christ are in this body. Chapter 1, the way he begins. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We've said this again and again, but it's important to note that Paul would not have asked somebody, Are you a Christian? He would have asked them, Are you in Christ? Have you been united with Christ? Have you, are you in union with the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the way he, he drives this home all the way through the, opening, uh, through the opening chapter. In him, verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance. In him. There's no inheritance outside of him. Our inheritance is in him. Our adoption is in him. Our security is in him. Our salvation is in him. The Lord is my salvation. What does that mean? It means that there is salvation only in him and is known only by those who are placed into him. Who places us into him? God does. How does he do it? Miraculously. Will we know? Absolutely. Will it be the same in every case? Probably not. But everyone will be able to say, the wonder of it is in this, that I, who was once outside of Christ, I once was a stranger to God and to grace, to quote the old hymns. Uh, I, I, once I was proud and believed I saw everything. But that has changed. Amen. Thank you for listening on Second Chance Ministry Radio.